Namaskara and welcome to BIC Talks, a podcast by Bangalore International Centre. MS Subbalakshmi's life was one of extraordinary achievement. Although she was portrayed in many ways as a musician who sought and achieved an all India appeal, a philanthropist and supporter of noble causes, an icon of style, a woman of piety and devotion, and a friend and associate of the good and the great, she was first and foremost a classical vocalist of the highest rank of unmatched gifts who lives on in the musical history of India. To explore more about the woman behind the voice, we have with us today Keshav Desiraju and Vishnu Vasudev in conversation about Keshav's book of Gifted Voice, which looks at M.S. Subbulakshmi's life and times and the great musical tradition she belonged to and to which she brought so much against the larger backdrop of developments in the world of Carnatic music. Kesham and Vishnu were live on BIC streams on the 23rd of February 2021. And this is a mildly edited version of the same conversation. And now, over to Vishnu. Thank you, Lekha, and welcome everyone. Welcome, Keshav. Really looking forward to this uh, session on uh, MS Subbalakshmi's life. So, Kesha, let me start with why you wrote this book. I think you've written that the primary purpose was to, in some ways, reclaim MS Subbalakshmi's legacy as a performer of the uh, highest order, one of the greatest classical musicians that we've had, uh, one of the 20th century's greatest performers, and a diva. So I was curious about... What compelled you to reclaim this legacy on her behalf? How has this legacy been or this reputation been lost over time or even during her lifetime? And what are some of the manifestations of that loss? What compelled you to write this book? Well, why did I write this book? Uh, you know, really there's two sets of reasons. One is for people my age, you could not really listen to Carnatic music, you could not grow up listening to music without being aware of the overwhelming presence of Subbalakshmi. You may not have cared very much, you may have cared a great deal, but it was a presence that could not be ignored. She was, as I can use the phrase somewhere in the book, the voice and the face of the form itself. Now, listeners today the millennials certainly, and even people a little older than the millennials, probably don't understand what this means because of exactly what presence is all about. So there was that, and as and therefore, when it, when I thought of writing a, a music-related book, writing about MS seemed like a very obvious thing to do. The other thing is, many images were claimed for MS. Many many roles were given to her to play and she played them all i mean she was i mean she was a trooper in the best sense of the word she she played them all brilliantly but she was primarily a classical musician of the highest rank and that is an image that i feel to me it seemed has always been underplayed she's been displayed in, in, in the public space you know as as a great bhakta as a singer of devotional songs, as a popular singer, as a nationalist character in some sense, and as you know, somebody who moved in the you know in elite circles. All this is true, but she was primarily an outstanding musician representing a very great tradition. And that's really what I wanted to do, which is why there's quite a lot in the book about concerts. Right. About songs, you know, because that was the stuff of her life for pretty much fifth, fifth, core 50 years of her life was just concert upon relentless concert. And that was what she was all about. And that is the MS that I wanted to, to talk about, if, if that makes sense. Yes. Yeah, that she was a very, very great figure, certainly in my time as, as, as a young listener. And to my mind, she has been 
correctly but not very fairly represent so you had mentioned this this you know 50 year period where relentless concert after concert where she in in many ways dominated the field right and she was a presence that you could not ignore and you've also said in the in the book you've described her as someone who transformed a tradition and who exalted an art so if you to look now look back on the impact that she's had on carnatic music in the way either it's presented the way it's perceived or the way the artists themselves perceive themselves what has been her impact on carnatic music would you say and if she hadn't been the person that she was uh, how might carnatic music be different today i would say vishnu there are two things going on here one was herself herself her personality her music what she did the other is she was fortunate to have been born at the time she was born some of this in the book uh, even if there was no ms vilakshmi there would have been a revolution in the lives of women in through those years it was social reform women's education women being dragged into the public space uh you know women doing things that they were prevented from doing earlier At the same time the the movement toward devadasi abolition all these things would have happened even without civilization and the fact that they happened at the time that she was just entering the music space and becoming a performer was extremely fortuitous and really helped in in, in making that so i think that we must remember these two things so she certainly gained from being born uh, born at the right time but she but i i think wonderful for all of us that she was born at that time because given that she she did wonderful things with it and i think she certainly very quickly she represented the aesthetic musical norm for women performers very very quickly and as we again we see in the book and huge numbers of women began singing again there was a lot of learning going on in within homes it's from well before this time but women appearing whether on radio whether in you know sabhas kacheris and ms clearly was was a role model so right. everybody wanted to be like him women musicians wanted to be like him because there she was in a beautiful glamorous voice beyond compare that i think is very very important the other thing is this great tradition of performance and she was not alone in this certainly uh, all the great have been great contemporaries all of them had these what i said 50 years of concert all of them had i mean their lives were just driven by new learnings new performance improvements on themselves settling into the style and i think in her case it was just so pronounced and so marked that she couldn't but influence the ecosystem in which she was living and working keshav i think this would be a good time for you to read an excerpt from the book and i think it gets at some of what you've been um, speaking of in terms of there it was an age of of many performers emerging okay. women artists so i believe this is from about 1940 or so so please go ahead friends this is from a chapter in the book which is called sarasivam and if you read the book <laughs> you will know why it is called sarasivam and this this talk is just after the release of subhulakshmi's 1940 film sakuntala in which she co-starred with the fabulously popular artist jn balasubramanian and i will start here Sakuntala was keenly anticipated and finally released in December 1940 and did well with Subhulakshmi and I quote on her way to becoming a legend she was no act, no great actor but her beauty rare charisma and fascinating voice impressed everyone without exception and coach even film india very popular film magazine at the time even film india which otherwise trashed the film held that emma subhulakshmi because of her musical talents and her intense popularity all over the south is easily the biggest drawing card in the picture the jewels were of course popular but connoisseurs went to see the film for gm balasubramanian's kamboji dhurtha and the song in kuntala varadi 
Many viewers went to see the comedy scene. The poster screamed, Kolki Nagana and Ms. Subulakshmi, the siren star of the South, all in capitals, in the matchless Tamil musical Sakuntala, supported by the master mirth makers, N.S. Krishnan, T.S. Durai Raj, T.A. Mukta. Not all viewers were impressed. The acerbic N.D. Nardacharya, the diarist with some note at that time, fussed. The Tamil screen will never improve unless we have there a different set of actors. Or is it that the Tamil genius abhors the histrionic art? The safe conclusion is that acting was, the acting was not up to much, but then the acting was never meant to be the point. It is interesting that though Subarakshan was well known, she was by no means the only aspiring star in Madras, or even the only star with that name. There was G. Subarakshan, a singer with many popular long playing records to her credit. There was S.D. Subarakshan, who was just about to begin shooting for him, Sasha Kirko. Singing on the radio were a V. Subarakshan, a P.L. Subarakshan, a J. Subarakshan, and a few years later, a K. Subarakshan. Then there was Tia Subulakshmi playing the flute. And again, there was Subulakshmi of Trivandrum. Our Subulakshmi was also performing. There is a record of a 90 minute radio recital in May, May 1939, which some songs not heard from her in later years. Tatva Maria and Deethi Gaula, Kapali and Mohana, Vallagada and Shankarabharam, Ma Ramanan and Hindolam, Meevala Gunadosham and Kapi, Paramukham and Kararatriya, Andavane and Shanukatriya, a Padam in Saveri, a Ragamalika, something described as a light song, and finally a bouquet of miscellaneous. In 90 minutes, it must have been a very blissful. I then talk a little, I'm not going to read about two other concerts of that time, I'm talking about what she was singing. And then I go on to say, it is necessary to look carefully at these early concerts. They reflect a very close attention to presenting a growing repertoire, a matter to which she paid less and less attention as she grew old. Even by this time, she was beginning to repeat herself at the same location. Kalki Krishnamurti observed canonly of her 30th December 1939 recital that while many features of her singing, the voice projection, the alapanas, the choice of songs, and even the pukaras were the same as of a few years earlier, she managed to infuse a freshness into them. This is the gift on which she fully capitalized. One enduring feature of this particular concert needs to be better known. Sukhulakshmi was so lost in her music that she concluded Nidhacharan, Peace and Kalyani, and then began a Kalyani Alapane again. Such a thing would never have been allowed to happen in the Sadasivan years. And another important conclusion one can draw from these early concerts is that Subhulakshmi had not yet begun to think of herself as a devotional singer. I think that passage uh, touches upon several crucial themes, right, uh, in her life. One is this idea of, of sameness, uh, which I want to explore a little more. I think what is ap apparent in the book is that there was a sense of sameness to her performance. This comes out in two ways. One is this idea of a, a you know, small set of revolving compositions that she would sing again and again in, in the same ragas. And I think by the end of the book, when you're listing the uh, compositions, you slip in the, and the inevitable Shankara Barnam. There's a lot of repetition. And the second is, uh, not only is it a repetition in ragas and compositions, but you also note that some of the alapanas and or even nervals and some of the so-called improvisational aspects of uh, the performance could sound the same even across decades. Uh, so my question to you is, what is it about her music that allowed her to get away with this? Because I, I cannot imagine any single artist of the present generation following such a strategy and surviving, right? You know, a small set of revolving songs in the same ragas, having alapanas that sound the same uh, year after year, repeating the same songs even at the same venues in the same year. So she not only got away with this, but actually thrived and made and became a star doing this. So how did she 
do it. That's, that's a very good question, Vishnu. It's one I have thought about a lot. Because as you rightly say, nobody could get away with it now. Audiences today, and I dare say even in those days, demand a certain variety in the what they get to listen to. I think what seems most likely is that what she was presenting was perfection. I've heard this Karaoke Alapana and this Pakara Nila very 25 times. But if you take it, if you take it out of context and listen to that Alapana and listen to that song rendering, it is perfect. And I think this is really was what at the heart of why she got away with doing this. Very recently I discovered the Kavarana song that I did not even know existed called Parakel or something in Sade. MS is singing it, I heard this on YouTube. It is sung with the same fineness and the same finish as she would have sung in the same Sade, Sri Kamakoti Peter Sutte, which she must have sung 200 times in her career, more perhaps. But if you just listen to the song, the song is rendered beautifully. My hunch is that this is what helped her. Because, if, okay, if the audience said, oh, it's the same song again. But they knew that what they were going to listen to was actually very, very nice. In the, in the, in the extract I just read, I mentioned that in the 1939 concert, she sang Jagaraja's Nivala in Kapi. On YouTube, you can hear her sing that in a 1993 wedding recital. She's, it is her great age. But that Arhapana is just beautiful. And this is it. She got away with it because what she was presenting was a, such an extraordinary order. I cannot think of any other reason. Partly it could be that her audiences were changing, but as you rightly observed, she was doing this even in Madras, you know, where the audience was broadly the same. It's not as though she was doing this only when she went out to Madras. What she was doing when she went out to Madras was you know, a reckless medley of songs, but that's a different issue. And what about the uh, so-called manodharma or improvisational aspects of music, right? Does she force uh, us in a way to uh, rethink what we mean by manodharma? And, or, or, was, was, or do you think she actually spontaneously came up with the same conception of the raga each time? No, I don't think so. I mean, you just have to listen to her great contemporary Amal Vasanta Kumari, you could listen to the same Ravi sung differently in different concerts. I don't believe that is true, that you know, it was just the one way. There was a certain element of, I mean, this was completely internalized. And as, an, and as I said in the earlier answer, it was internalized perfectly, but it was still, she was enormously risk averse. Mm. It's also, it's almost as though once she found or that, that something was working and something was well put together. It served her purpose. She really didn't see the need to keep mucking around with something that was doing quite well the way it was. Right. I'm not sure if you plan to play that extract of Devon or it is a Yes. It's only 90 seconds. He has told you what Devaman Ali is about in those 90 seconds. He probably thought, well, it's fine. It's fine to think what she would have thought, which is not easy. But it is something that has to be, it has to be mentioned. I mean, in any study of her music, any analysis of her performance style has to say this. And when I said, uh, I mentioned Vasanta Kumari earlier, but there was such enormous variety and range in what Vasant Kumari is saying. You could always go to a concert and come back hearing two songs that you did not even know exist. Right. And even alone, you know, sung by anybody. So it's, uh, it was that, but as I said, this worked for her and she stuck with it. She was risk averse. Whether she was risk averse by temperament or whether her managers and her husband Position having the risk of us is a matter of discussion, but she was risking Which we will get to, yeah. Which we will get to. So let me play that piece. Uh, For those of you who are listening in, this is from 1971 recital. 
It's a very brief alapana and the Pallavi of the Kyagaraja song, Kanna Kandri Napa in Devanavari. It's not a song that many would have heard, Subhulak so sing because she did not sing it often at all. But the reason why Vishnu and I thought it would be good today is because she shows in a very brief alapana everything that needs to be said about a ragam. And the Pallavi of that song also demonstrates many of the high points of the Kyagaraja composition, the use of Sangatis and you listen to it, you'll know what I'm saying. Vishnu? certainly get the sense of polish that you speak of, which I assume can uh, come only from hours of, of rehearsal, right? I mean, yeah, I mean, it's very tough to describe music, but it's, you, you get the sense of polish, but it's certainly not stayed in any way. And if I understand right, Keshav, this is not a song she sang very often either. No, not at all. Not at all. We didn't listen to the full song, but it's in good shape. It's fully, it's fully under control. I've heard, I mean, I, someone I was speaking to said to me that, you know, occasionally, especially in wedding concerts, you should be asked to sing a particular song. And she would actually learn it for the occasion and not sing it again. But on that one occasion, it would have been perfectly produced. So we've spoken a little bit on the, uh, about the sort of sameness uh, uh, of, of some of her music, right? Um, I, I want to get to some of the differences uh, and variety that came into her music over time. 
or, or rather the evolution and, and change in the music. So in, in, in the book and in the last section, which is a sort of coda, you mentioned the seven stages of a life that one Ramaswamy Iyer has uh, defined. And you, I think, add two more. But you note that, you know, in the 40s and, and 50s, perhaps, you know, the concerts were, were pretty packed with songs, very brisk pace, uh, perhaps, uh, you know, lots of energy and so on and so forth. And, and following a certain style or a mode of, of singing of that, of that age. And then you highlight especially the late 60s and early 70s as where she's almost reached perfection. And you speak especially of a music academy concerts where she's in the words I think you use are, are joyous control. Uh, so can you tell us a little bit about the evolution of her music over time and also the influences that might have shaped those, any of those changes? Thank you for mentioning, uh, you know, Nelson Ayer was a civil servant and very great Asika, who wrote uh, very interestingly about music. And he once identified what he calls seven stages. And what I've done in the book is mention those seven stages and also make some suggestions of particular songs that I thought represented uh, that particular phase. And so he has a very early career when Subhulakshmi's bell-like voice was still the marker. And the example I give there is something that actually listeners should find on their own, the song Shyama Sundara from the film Seva Sadhana. It, the only reason I recommend it is it, the earliest recording of Subhulakshmi that I've been able to find. It's a film song, but uh, it was, as Ramaswamy, I used to say, that they have a very early career, you know, a high, sharp, sparkling voice. Then there was slightly more classical orientation. You know, those of you who have heard uh, Arul Puriwai and Hansabhani, an early 40s record, or Narayana Bhidhinam again, it's a record of those times. Then she began the third stage maturing as a great artist. There are several commercial recordings available of full concerts in the 50s. The Music Academy 1956 concert, a concert in Bhavani in Euro district, uh, also in 1956. Then there was what Iyer called the full flowering of her musical prowess. The UN concert is one example. The next stage would be Prabhulakshmi is a great classical musician. The Music Academy recited the season recitals of the late 60s. And the sixth stage of the late mature phase, I mean, Vande Vasudevam from the Anamacharya selection is a good example of that phase. Now, quite obviously, the early years were much influenced by her singing for films. She sang a lot for the gramophone record, where by definition, you had to finish whatever you were doing within two minutes or two and a half minutes. So you had to be fast and brisk about what you were doing. So there was that. Then there was the film, the whole nature of film music is such that, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a different type from what a musician would do, actually do on a concert platform. And that really is my sense of the way in which she began the first two or three phases of the musical career, fast renderings, quicksilver alapanas, very fast swarams, you know, everything was quick, but the audiences also liked it. That's what they were all doing then. That is what Vasanta Kokanam was doing, and the, the early Vasanta Kauri also was doing that. This really went on into the mid, mid 50s, even the late 50s. I think the 60s was really the greatest concert years because there is, there is a lot less of speed and much more of repose. Mm -hmm. There is a certain calmness that comes into it. And you have longer alapanas than was common in the 50s. And there was just very, very solid song rendering. But since we are talking about her performance style, as again, as I said somewhere in the book, all this was really only for the jazz. By the time the 60s came, whenever she went out of the jazz, unless it was to the grand Sabha performances in Bombay or Kolkata, where the audience was as learned, if not more, than the Madras audience, anywhere else in India, there would just be a completely reckless mixture of big songs, small songs, bhajans, bhajans before, bhajans after. It was what was decided for her, I believe, that 
<coughs> audiences that are not fully familiar with the Carnatic world uh, would like this. You know, something that you always read written up of Lord Subhulakshmi was that, you know, she has sung in some 14 languages or something. Now, this is interesting without being important in any way. Why was it so important for to be known as somebody who sang in all these languages? Right. Really, it made no difference to her as a musician, but that was being promoted as an essential feature of her musicality and her performance style. Whereas, right. to my mind, there was so much else that was significant about her performance style, which was not allowed to be allowed to be displayed. And then, after the great concert years. She had a very long pre-retirement, you know. She was really singing all through the 70s quite often. The tapering off in concerts began in the 80s, but there were still many concerts through that period. And even in the early 90s when, uh, yes, this falling back on the known, the true, endless repetitions, shorter concerts, always still wonderful to listen to, but it was effectively an artist in retirement. She had such a very long career. The, the, the first Kacheri for which we actually have a ticket, 1934, and the last Kacheri was 1996. I mean, for 62 years, she was doing, shall we say, ticketed performances. Right. That's a very long time. And I think you must cut some slack for somebody who's been at it <laughs> for so long. Uh, so I think uh, you know eventually, uh, inevitably, we have to get to uh, Sadasivam, right? And and I think you alluded to him in a couple of uh, responses now. How do we uh, think of uh, Sadasivam, right? So clearly, and from the book and any account of her life, he comes across as a dominant figure. He clearly had a very important role in shaping her career, managing her career. My question to you is twofold. One is, what effect did he have and what impact did he have on her musical personality? So what I mean by that is her conception of what makes good music or not. How much did his dominating presence dictate that as well? And second is, how willing was she as a partner in this whole project of projecting M.S. Subhalakshmi as this very multifaceted personality singing in many languages, very devotional, meeting with Gandhiji, Rajaji, so on and so forth, right? All, all the things that you're trying to reclaim her from. I mean, how, how, how much of a willing participant was she in these endeavors? I think you mentioned at one point that she had a repertoire of 2,500 uh, songs. Is it actually entirely Sadasavan's fault that she sang only a few of them at a time? That's actually three very difficult questions in one. Sadasavan was a great impresario. I mean, he was many things. Just as MS was many things, he was also many things. But he was primarily an impresario. And he did his job extremely well. His job was to promote her. His job was to protect her. His job was to manage her career. And I think nobody disputes the fact that he did that extremely well. He promoted her, he protected her. More than anything else, he protected her. And that would have been, that is, that was indeed a very, very important uh, factor in this whole story of, you know, wherein lay his attraction. I think prime reason for that was he was protection. You know, what could have been a very difficult and even unpleasant world that she may have otherwise had to occupy. And it was not just Madurai, but also the film world in 1940s would not really be particularly pleasant. So he played his role as an impresario wonderfully well. Now, we do know that she had musical imagination, musical understanding, musical perceptions of her own. If you listen to her Tanam, if you listen to her Nerva, and I hope you get a chance to listen to her Nerva later on, if you listen to her duty, if you listen to her Gulpans, you listen to her Skotram singing, you listen to her chants, which made her very important in the later part of her life, she very clearly understood musical presentation, 
and she understood that these things needed to be learned. I have recently been listening to a lot of Musiri, and it's amazing how much Alapana she's obviously learned from him. Hmm. So she clearly there was a very, very active musical imagination at work. But I think where Sadasivam's influence completely dominated her the presentational aspect is he, he determined the songs for the items to be performed in, in any concert. There was no deviation possible. And he had very, a very clear sense of what he thought the audience would like. And there was just no getting away from that. Now, obviously he understood that some occasions were different because again, to go back to what I do with the music academy concert, the season concerts, there are new songs being produced, there are unusual things being done. There are some really wonderful Rajantan and Pallavis presented through those years in the academy concerts. And even if you look at the structure of the United Nations concert or the Carnegie Hall concert, clearly there has been some, you know, it's a very intelligent putting together. But there was also this, uh, I think there is reason to think that she did not particularly enjoy having to repeat herself so many times. But the truth also is that she really had no say in that. Uh, it, it was something that she had to do. And again, as we said earlier in the conversation, it seemed to be, it seemed to be drawing the crowds. There's a very peculiar notion uh, uh, in the world of Carnatic music, which is Janaranjaka, or that which appeals to the public. Mm. And uh, it's very, I mean, I have always found it very mysterious as to how exactly Janaranjaka happens and why any particular object at any point of time is deemed to have Janaranjaka. In her case, I can understand why, because we're saying there's so much wonderful uh, music to be heard. but. I think that, that's really what happened to her husband, figured out that this is what works, this is what people like. And you know, in the South, even, I've said somewhere in the book, even bhajans, which by, to my mind, in the North Indian tradition, always allow the performer a considerable attitude, a considerable degree of, you know, uh, being able to extemporize. Even bhajans were reduced to, Pallavi and Pallavi Charanam format. But it seemed to work. Did he get any inputs from anyone else? What, what was formative in his idea of what an audience uh, wanted? I have to say, he certainly was very close to very serious, you know, literary people like Kalki Krishnamurti and Rajaji. It's, all, it's almost certainly he would have learned from them. And, but other than that, I'm not able to say anything. Moving on to this question of what her life could have, may have been, right? Uh, and I think in the, in either the preface or, or an introductory passage, you, you say that her life was clearly the stuff of tragedy. And there's this sense of a snuffing out of a, of a personality, right? So is there any way of passing out or uh, maybe it's in the realm of speculation, but what might have been? So if she hadn't made this grand trade-off of moving from the uh, Devdasi tradition, moving into the Sadasivam household, allowing him to essentially manage and determine many aspects of her career and her art, what would we have gained and uh, what would she have gained and what might we have lost? Uh, would, would she have been a much happier person, but maybe we don't know about, we wouldn't have known about her or was she already a star and therefore we would have heard about her anyway and presumably a happier MS. Uh, is there any way of figuring that out? Well, I'm glad you began your question by saying that all this is speculation. <laughs> that is what it is. But seriously, what might have happened to her? I think there are some clues. I mean, once one possibility or uh, look at the career of Bala Saraswati and Brinda, who were her exact contemporaries, whose background was identical, and who were entering the performing space at the same time. Bala Saraswati, whose performing genius was on a par with Subhrashtas, 
greatest dancer of our time. Hail not just in India but around the world, one of the world's great dancers. Now, yes, so certainly that is a possibility. So, despite a very well placed patron, Barasas really had to live her life on her own and make her own decisions, make her own career, and do what she did, and did it without without a dominating man in her life. So that is. I ask you if you could have said that Prabhupada had that model. There was also Brinda, who was who did not achieve the same distinction as shall we say Bharama did, but lived and was greatly respected through her life, through her career, respected and even adored for the depth of her knowledge and for being prominent, you know, representative of a great performing tradition coming from the family of Dhanama. So that is also a possibility, that could also. But the one important point to remember though is from what we know of all these women, both Dharasasati and Vrinda are very strong characters who were actually capable of negotiating life on their own. Who had, who may not have been, as I said somewhere in the book, throughout her life, she gave the impression of extreme vulnerability. And it is possible that she did not have the same uh, you know, ability to negotiate life with, with, with all its difficulties entirely on her own. It is also possible that she knew this. Mm. And which is why seeking protection was so important to her. That is one set of thoughts. The other possibility in her case, of course, was films. See, Arab Seva Sadam in 1938, Shakuntala in 1940. Suppose there had been, she had not made the transition she made. She may have continued in films. Maybe she would have become someone like A.D. Sundaram Bharatwansi, who had a very successful film and concert career. Right. But she was also a tough character. She was nobody's for sure. She lived life on her own terms. She managed herself. She managed her money. She was able to, 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 to make a life and career for herself. So I think it all comes down to what it seems to me that, you know, her Subhulakshmi's essential timidity. She was a timid person. She knew that she would be she would be in difficulties if she did not have the protection of other, another person. Her mother's protection was obviously not going to be enough anymore. And right. that is where Sarasim appeared. And to my mind, she's a very honorable woman who stuck to her part of the deal. You know, she she went along with everything that was asked of her. You know, Radha Vishwanathan has written somewhere that when my mother married my father, she said, all she wanted was to retire into family and raise children. She did not want to be anything more than just a wife and mother. And if Radha thought this, then it means Radha who possibly was a woman who knew her best yeah. in her entire life. If Radha thought this, then there is something in it. So she may, if Sarasana had not been interested in promoting his wife and took the view, he, he could easily have taken the, the conservative view that, you know, you know, all the singing stuff is no longer for you. She would have gone along completely. Mm. She would have gone along completely. So you have to give him that, that she, he decided, he just, it was not her decision. He decided that she was going to be a singing star mm. and he worked on it. So it, it, it makes one's assessment of him a little difficult because he was obvious. You said, why did I use the words the stuff of tragedy? Because at one level, the deletion of a personality, as it were, is obviously tragic. If anybody, it doesn't necessarily have to be a great star. Mm -hmm. Any person's natural temperament and beliefs and personality is erased in a certain way. To my mind, it is tragic. But then he did produce something quite extraordinary. And it's something extraordinary which she was also aware. I mean, she knew who she was. Right. I mean, I don't think she made any mistake about this. She knew very well. She didn't speak about it. I don't believe it went to her head. Uh, she didn't throw her weight around. But she knew she was a mess. And I think this is what makes for a very interesting life. And I think this is a point you make in the in the book as well that very clearly she knew uh, who she was, what she stood for, the talent she had, 
So what about her ambition? Was she an ambitious person? I mean, you've spoken of perhaps her being happy, just being at home. Or did she want to dominate the field like she did? Well, Vishnu, look, mother and daughter left Madurai and came to Madras in about 1932, which is quite a daring move. Right. Madurai was where they belonged. Madurai was where they belonged for generations. That was a known world. There would have been a life for them there. But they came out of Madurai. As a very young girl, she began recording. So I'm not sure whether the word to use is ambition, but she clearly wanted. If, if, if somebody from the recording company came home and said, Will you sing? Quite obviously, she sang into listen to some of the early recordings. I mean, she's singing very enthusiastically. You know, it's yeah. a, this is not a child who's being made to do something she doesn't want to do. Yeah. And then the move to Majas, with all its uncertainties, and as I say in the book, we still really have very little idea of what they were doing in Majas. Where were they living? What were they learning? Who was looking after them? All very vague. Then films. Seva Sadhanam, she was signed on in 1936 when she was 20. I mean, it takes some, again, I don't know if ambition is the word, but it takes some sense of where I want to go, what I want to do, to accept a film role. And then Chakuntala after that. So clearly, there was, she was not entirely, a totally retiring, timid, you know, wallflower kind of person. She wanted to get somewhere, she wanted to do something, but it's also possible that as she grew older and she realized what the inevitable consequences were of her continuing to live with her mother, she possibly figured out that at that point in time it became more important for her to seek protection than to seek to become any kind of performing artist. But I think that she wanted to become a performing artist is undeniable based on the fact that they came to Madras, that she sang for records and she had written films. Do we have any inkling of what her inner life was about, what made her tick? I mean, I, I think at some point in the book you mentioned that she was doing close to 100 concerts, maybe a month or was it a year, but, but a lot of concerts, right? In many ways she didn't, apart from the acclaim, all the proceeds were for charity, for maintaining Kalki gardens, uh, various other things. And there was there were some financial setbacks. So mm. through all of this, do we know what kept her going? And, and to keep this unflagging pace of concerts and, and sometimes very fairly random concerts, right? Hard to say because she was a sort of obviously ritual-minded person, you know, a lot of her time went in you know, ritual worship at home. And uh, there was a lot of visits to holy men and people like this. And there were a lot of worship, ritual, prayer. All this was very important in the lifestyle that was, that she either created or was created for her. The only thing she knew, which was the content of what she was singing, and that is discussed in the book. I mean, the content of the, the form, the Carnatic form, is so overwhelmingly religious that pretty much all she was thinking about learning, reading, repeating, singing had religious content. Mm. So I've only said at the end of the book that I have no doubt that she was a believing woman. But more than that, I'm not sure in the position to say. So maybe we'll play the snippet of a narrative. Good. You are playing the Ratanji or Naraval. Good. Uh, many of you will know this, but Naraval is a point in any song rendering where the artist takes up a pre-composed line and then extemporizes on it. And the song that we are going to hear an extract from is Swati Prunal's Rama Rama Gunasima, which is a piece that she may have learned from Musini Subramanya. I hope you will enjoy listening to this.
Radha Vishnu are also singing with uh, Subhulakshmi, alternating in the Naradam lines. 
It's thank you. That was from the Carnegie Hall Recital of 1977. So now that you mention uh, Radha, maybe briefly, uh, Keshav, uh, what was their relationship uh, like? And as you say, Radha is probably the one who knew her best. The interesting thing about Radha Rishunadhan is that for all her enormous training and experience, she willingly settled into the role of second singer. And she gave an interview once saying that, and I've quoted this in the book, that all she ever wanted was not to pause and that no one should say that she spoiled and Mrs. Singing. And that was a very, it's a very modest ambition yeah. for somebody who lived, worked, sang, learned with Subhulakshmi for 60 years. It's a modest ambition in one way and a very difficult ambition in another way. A very difficult ambition in another way because you should be learning so much. and uh, But to always remain at, uh, as a second singer. But I think that quite remarkable in her own way. She had a brief career in childhood as a dancer. Mm. And she was actually the first student of Varu Ramayabil, who later became very famous as a dance teacher and the rest. But uh, that was only for a few years before she settled into a role of second singer. Uh, stuff exactly. like that. There's a, there's a lot on all of this in the book. And for those of you who have been kind enough to sit through this program, I hope very much you also do this. I was going to say exactly the same thing. I cannot uh, recommend this book highly enough. It's not only very nuanced and complete uh, as far as Ms. Subalakshmi's life is concerned, but Especially if you're not very familiar with Carnatic music, there are some excellent notes and glossary and appendices which will give you a very good sense of the music and as well as the 20th century. Thank you very much, Vishnu. Wonderful talking to you. And thank you, Lekha and Ravi and others of the BIC. And thank you all for joining and being part of this moment. Thank you for listening in till the end. Please share this episode with a friend on social media, WhatsApp or anywhere else. It would mean the world to us. And in case you're listening via iTunes or Apple Podcasts, please leave us a rating and a review. Subscribe to BIC Talks on email or your favorite podcast app and don't miss out on future episodes. This episode of BIC Talks has Gaurav Krishna as our sound engineer with support from S. Sarvanaraj and Lekha Naidu. And the accompanying episode artwork was made by Chandni Venkataraman. Thank you for listening to this episode of BIC Talks. This podcast can be accessed on our website, bangaloreinternationalcenter.org, as well as on any of your favorite podcast platforms. Tune in for new episodes every week. And do subscribe to our YouTube channel and follow our Facebook, Twitter and Instagram pages to stay informed on our latest updates.